right, let's talk about types of bonds. Bonds. Types of bonds. You know, like James. James Bond. Okay, anyway, yeah. I'm going to stop now. All right. Okay, in order to understand bonds, you have to understand this little chart here called electron affinity. Okay, so every single atom will have the tendency to accept, pull in, take an electron from another element. And so this is the chart showing you how much each element likes electrons. Okay, so here's the number value that has been placed to that. We call those electronegativity values. And so you can see that, um, for example, fluorine has a really high electronegativity value, super high. Um, in fact, it's the highest electronegativity value versus um, francium here down at the bottom left, very low. So it kind of works its way. Um, the farther top right you get, uh, high values, bottom left, low values. So, but we're going to use this chart to show us what types of bonds are made. Okay, we're going to go through these, but this is a table that you'll use to show us, uh, show us kind of like where do these electronegativity values fall. So if you take the difference in some of uh, some bond values, like what kind of bond is that? So like if the bond is a difference of one point, uh, greater than 1.7, then it falls in what we call the ionic character. If it's between 0.4 and 1.7-ish, we call it an ion, uh, a polar covalent character. If it's uh, less than 0.4, um, <clears throat> I still put both of these. We could kind of group these together. This is not my most favorite chart. So basically, if it's less than 0.4, meaning going down to zero, I call both of these uh, nonpolar. So you might want to fix that. So I'm going to get rid of this mostly polar thing. I'm just going to call it nonpolar. So you might want to fix your notes. So we're just going to say less than 0.4 is nonpolar. All right. So this is the chart you'll refer to. Just so just when we when I say hey, go to that chart. That's what we're talking about. All right. So hit these a little bit like more like actually talking about them. Okay, so the first type we have, a bond we have is an ionic bond. Um, so this is where we actually have charges. We have ions, um, and they have, um, you know, for the most part, these are going to start with metals. They make ionic compounds. We've talked about a little bit about how another name for them is salts. Um, and basically, this is the stealing factor where the electrons are completely ripped off from the other atom or taken away or accepted in by another atom. Um, uh, atom, so we get positive and negative charges, and then that that positive and negative duality ends up to be equal. So that's what's happening with our ionic bonds. And of course, we've already talked about, um, you saw earlier in that chart, that you have to have a um, electron negativity difference. It has to be greater than 1.7. So if we want to consider a compound ionic, we would take the difference of the parts and say, hey, it's greater than 1.7. Then we have something called a covalent bond. A covalent bond is basically where they share electrons. Um, we have the sharing factor. And I, I kind of hate that word share because it's not truly sharing. They are... Um, both using that electron, but it is a battle. It's like a tug of war. They are fighting over the electron, and that's what we have to think about it. Usually they start with nonmetals. We also call them molecules. So that's where you get the word water molecule from, from the fact that water is made from a covalent bond. Now, the thing you have to keep in mind, too, and that's why I said it's a battle. It's not a nice equal sharing all the time, uh, or it's not pleasant, is because the sharing does not always have to be equal. Um, you know, it's not like mom and dad are sitting around and go, share that electron equally, you know. No, it's a battle. It's a tug of war. Somebody might be pulling a little bit more of the electron. Somebody might be pulling a little bit less. It just depends on, you know, what the strength of the atom that's doing the pull. And that's where we get into 
two different types of covalent bonds. So a polar bond is a type of a covalent bond. Um, so that's the thing you have to think about is that this is where we get an unequal sharing of our electrons. So, and we might make a little note here that this is a type of covalent bond. So we have a polar covalent bond basically. Um, <clears throat> bonding, first of all, you have to understand it's not most of the time clearly ionic or clearly covalent. So just kind of keep that in mind. It's a little confusing, but um, but polar covalent bonds are where you start to get into the ionic character. Um, you can only dissolve polar uh, polar substances in polar substances. You get the electron negativity differences. I wrote it here between 0.4 and 1.7. And what happens here is that basically the electron is pulled a little bit closer to one of the other one of the atoms and so we get this thing called a dipole. Alright, so I have a drawing down here at the bottom of HCl. Alright. And so what happens here? Alright, so I have a hydrochloric acid molecule down here. Okay, if you can see at the bottom. Alright. <clears throat> so the big thing here is I have the chlorine, which is here, and the hydrogen, which is here. Now, um, hopefully you can see that. I know the trial thing is kind of on top of it. but um, Now, chlorine, if you look on your little chart of your electronegativities, it has a 3.16. Hydrogen only has like a 2.20. Chlorine loves electrons versus hydrogen, not as much. So what's going to happen is, is that, oh, I guess they're even written over there for you. <laughs> uh, so chlorine is going to draw, pull that electron so much harder than hydrogen that it actually kind of hogs the electron. Like you can think about this molecule as like a dividing line. Like if I draw down here, like this is a dividing line for the molecule. It's like a tug of war. You know how like you draw a line in tug of war and like, um, when they say go, you start pulling, and somebody eventually, hopefully, gets the rope over their line. Well, what happens is, is that chlorine is stronger. It's got that 3.16. So he actually takes this electron, and he pulls it to his side. And what happens is, is that he's not strong enough, though, to, like, completely pull it off and, like, take it like a typical ionic compound would. So what happens is, is that he pulls it enough, though, that he can say, hey, I kind of have more of it. Ha, ha, I have more of it. And what that does is that it creates what we call here a partial, that's what this is, this represents, this represents a partial negative charge. And then, so if one thing has a partial positive, because we know that all compounds are neutral, this right here represents the partial positive charge. And that's what we talk about, like polar um, compounds, and we talk about dipoles. Dipoles meaning two poles. We have a positive pole and a negative pole. And so that's what we get here. We have a dipole molecule. <clears throat> and so that's what's happening. Now, we also have the opposite where we do have actually equal sharing happening. So nonpolar is actually where we get the equal sharing. Um, electronegativity difference basically of, ne of 0.4 or less. Um, and this only dissolves nonpolar things. And so a lot of times nonpolar, um, the biggest examples I can think are when you bond something with itself. So like if you have, you know, like N2 or O2s, things like that where they're bonded to themselves, where obviously they're of the exact same strength, so they're not going to be able to pull harder than one element because our electronegativities are exactly the same. Okay, so there's some uh, of those. Let's look at some examples, though. Um, classify the following as covalent or ionic, and we can even take covalent to the next level because we know we have polar covalent and nonpolar covalent. All right, so let's start out with HBr. All right, so we have HBr. Okay, 
So what I would do is, and I always start with the negative charge first. If you don't start with the negative, you're just going to get a negative number and just realize that you make it positive. So it's not a big deal. So I have H and BR. So what I would do is go to that chart that I had before and look at the negativity values. Like, for example, BR is 2.96 and hydrogen is 2.20. And then basically subtract them. The difference is 0 0.7. 6 for this value. Okay? And so, then I go and I look at the table and I say, okay, where does that fall? Where is the ionic character? Where is the um, <clears throat> polar covalent character? Because remember that if we go to that chart that I gave you in, in the very beginning, if it's greater than uh, 1.7, it's ionic. If it's 0.4 to about 1.7, it's polar covalent. And if it's 0.4 or um, less, then we can consider it nonpolar. So for this one, you're falling in the 0.76 category. So we would consider that, I would consider that, first of all, covalent, because that's all the question is asking. But, <coughs> excuse me, we can classify it even farther oops, by saying it's polar covalent. Now, what about the next one? CaF2. So I have a calcium and I have a fluorine. So I'm going to look up those two. And actually, I just wrote those backwards. So again, it doesn't matter as long as you end up with the positive number. So for example, calcium is 1. Fluorine is 3.98. So obviously in my calculator or whatever, or mentally because it's just subtracting 1, the difference is going to be 2.98, um, right? If I, either way. So in this case, I have an ionic character because it's greater than 7, or 1.7. All right, and last but not least, I have CP. All right, so I have CP. Okay, so let's see. I have carbon and I have phosphorus. Again, I probably wrote that backwards, but that's okay. Let's see, because you're not going to know until you're going to look at the chart. So you have 2.55 for carbon, 2.19 for phosphorus. Nope, this time I wrote it correctly. So 2.55 minus 2.19 is 0.36. Which, look, it falls below 0.4, so that's going to be an example of a nonpolar covalent compound. Okay. All right. So now the last thing we need to talk about is intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are the forces that now we have our molecules, whether they're bonded together by nonpolar, polar or ionic, however they're held together. Now, I'm sorry, it wouldn't be ionic because this only happens for, we're talking about the interactions between covalent compounds. So, um, so whether they're held together by nonpolar or they're held together by polar interactions, now we have these interactions. How are those molecules held together? And these are called intermolecular forces. Um, and so many physical properties occur because of intermolecular forces. For example, how strong water is, is because of how it's held together. Um, but again, we have relatively low melting points and boiling points of some molecular forces because of these intermolecular forces. Um, many covalent compounds are relatively soft. But unlike ionic compounds, they're not going to have the structure, the strength as. That's why most um, covalent compounds and things are liquids or gases, because they just can't form those structures. And that's because of the intermolecular forces involved. Okay, there are three types of intermolecular forces. There are hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole forces, and van der, van der Waal forces. Now, here's the thing you have to keep in mind. If it has a hydrogen bond, it also has dipole-dipole, and it also has van der Waal. If it has 
di uh, dipole dipole, it also has van der Waal. You think about this as like a hierarchy in the sense of it, if it has the top one, then it has the other two. But we want to find out what's the top one it has. Like what, for sure, does it have hydrogen bonding? Does it have dipole dipole? Does it, like what's the top one it has? And that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, so the first thing that we have is hydrogen bonding. It's basically the attraction between a hydrogen atom and an electronegative atom such as nitrogen, oxygen, um, or fluorine. Um, now keep in mind, again, this is not a true bond, okay? Our true bonds are covalent and ionic bonding. So we use the term bond, but it's not a bond. It's an intermolecular force. Now, this happens between polar covalent compounds. So, one way that you know that you have a hydrogen bond is, first of all, you, that you have a polar covalent compound. Another way that you know you have a hydrogen bond is because, obviously, it's got to have hydrogen in it. If it doesn't have hydrogen in it, uh-uh, sorry, bye-bye. Okay, the second way is, is that it not only does it have to have a hydrogen, it then, therefore, has to have nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So basically, that limits down your um, possibilities down quite a bit. Okay, so there's few combinations that we'll be looking at in this class that are hydrogen bonding. One example of a hydrogen bond, though, that you guys are used to, water molecules are put together by hydrogen bonding. Because what happens is, is that you have this water molecule And what happens is, is that the O's and H's are attracted to each other by hydrogen bonding. Okay. All right, next one. Dipole-dipole is the force between two oppositely charged ends of two nonpolar molecules. All right, so, <clears throat> again, this happens between polar, covalent, compounds. Now the other thing is, is that you have to keep in mind is that it does include hydrogen bonding. So if it's hydrogen bonding, it's also a dipole-dipole. Why is that? Because anything that's going through hydrogen bonding has a dipole because it's a polar covalent compound. Basically what happens here is like, let's take for example, in our earlier example problems, we had HBr. Bromine is going to get that partial negative. Hydrogen is going to get the partial positive. We put another exact molecule right next to it. What's going to happen here is this partial positives and partial negatives, the poles of each other, what happens when positives and negatives are near each other? They attract. That is dipole-dipole interactions. This is your dipole-dipole. All right. Last but not least, we have what's called van der Waal forces. Van der Waal forces are where they... A molecule exhibits a momentary dipole, basically. It's an induced dipole. Because obviously, we have to have some kind of way that nonpolar molecules can basically hook up for a while. And so what happens is, is like, okay, so you have like N and N, and then N and N. Let's say we have something like this. We know that these guys have electrons that float around them. Okay, well, there comes a point in time where the electron might be on this side, which gives it a partial negative, and the electron that it's sharing is over here, you know, somewhere, which gives this one a partial positive, but it's not a true partial positive. I guess I should erase that. Should give it a tiny, tiny little positive, 
you know, on a tiny, tiny little negative. And so, but it's, and again, I did that backwards because that one should be negative. Negative, positive, you get the point. So, but what happens is, is that it's, it's not a true positive and not a true negative. So you want to mark those out. But it's enough that it kind of does an interaction for a little bit. But again, it doesn't last. So it's like, it's like as soon as it happens, it's erased. So that's why it's an induced dipole. It only happens, it's like, hey, we interact, then it's gone. Interact, and it's gone. Interact, and it's gone. So that's why it's so easy to break down nonpolar molecules. Because their interactions are like, we're together when we're not. It's like those couples that they break up like every other day. It's exactly like that. Okay? So, and again, these are for your nonpolars because they have to be able to interact too. All right? So that's all your bonding. We'll do some practice and stuff with that. And that's all she wrote.